Welcome. Hello, everyone. Thanks again for everybody being patient as we get this uh, webinar uh, going. My name is Christine Brown, and I'm the Director of Trade Policy here at SBA's Office of International Trade. Uh, we want to thank you for joining us on this installment of SBA's Learn to Trade Roundtable series. Um, the mission of SBA's Office of International Trade is to enhance the ability of small businesses to compete in the global marketplace. And this series, this Learn to Trade series, is really designed to help small businesses to identify the resources that can help them export more effectively and more intentionally. Uh, we've recently had uh, uh, sessions on how to develop a, your export plan and exporting 101. And today's discussion is focused on how to get paid when you're selling internationally. Um, this we know from our engagement with small businesses and surveys that getting paid is one of the top concerns uh, that can really hold uh, them back from selling their goods and services internationally. And we know that banks often see exporting as more risky. Uh, so today we're pleased to be uh, able to discuss how to address these concerns and get paid. And we're joined by two experts from SBA's Export Finance Team and SBA's Small Business Development Center Network. Before we begin, uh, I would just want to take care of a few administrative items. Uh, while we're doing the presentation, we really appreciate if you could keep your microphone and video muted. Um, we also wanted to mention that we are recording today's session, so if you're not comfortable with that, please sign off now. Um, we ask that you put any questions in the chat. We are going to be working to respond to those questions live, um, and I'll be uh, working on that with my colleague Sarah Bonner, who's a senior international trade policy specialist. So please do, as the conversation is going, put your questions into the chat. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Sarah um, and our speakers uh, to really get the conversation started. Thank you, Christine. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, it's Financial Literacy Month. Um, I'm excited that we're all here together to get smarter. Uh, we have two of our um, top financial experts on trade financing and financial planning joining us today. First, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Dan Holt, who's an international finance specialist at SBA's Office of International Trade. Dan received his BA from the Citadel in Charleston. He has a long military career as well as a career in retail operations and financial services and banking. Um, he covers North Carolina and South Carolina if those are the states you hail from. Um, and in that role he works closely with SBA's lending partners and he provides free um, trade finance counseling. So he's a great resource for you guys um, to connect with afterwards as, as well as his colleagues. Thank you, Dan, for joining us. Um, it's always great to have your expertise. Um, and I love relying on you when we get great calls from our hotline. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Mike Siebert, um, who's from our Small Business Development Center Network. Um, Dr. Siebert is Director of Statewide Programs and Services at the Small Business and Technology Development um, Center in North Carolina. As a trusted advisor, Dr. Siebert provides no-cost business counseling for U.S. small businesses in North Carolina. Um, he helps with dom domestic and global strategies and helping to refine your international products and services and costing strategies. Um, he's also a certified global business um, professional. Thank you, Dr. Siebert. Um, with that, I'd like to get started jumping into some of the questions I know we all have about how to get paid. Um, today, I'm really looking forward to talking about how to mitigate risk and what steps a small business can do to be more resilient when competing in the global economy. So to kick it off, Dan, I'd like to throw the first question to you. Um, as we know, about two thirds of small businesses share their concern about receiving payments when potentially um, working with foreign buyers. How do you advise small businesses to make sure they can get paid? First, they should be concerned. Uh, if you're a small business, the question is, can you afford to lose? And if you can't afford to lose, it's like gambling. You shouldn't gamble. 
So you to eliminate the gambling, and this is something that's age old. This is not something invented recently. We're talking Marco Polo old uh, and older. So there are two methods that we that are commonly available to you. One is a letter of credit. This uh, this is not a beginner's type subject. Uh, this is a subject that if we were going to teach it, we would need from three to six hours. So if you're going to do letters of credit, the first thing you've got to do is learn because uh, going into a letter of credit is one of those things that your knowledge base has to be higher. And oddly enough, foreign buyers are all familiar with this because they learned this in high school, but nobody in the United States uses letters of credit. So you need to, before you start, or you tell your customers, I'll have a letter of credit with that, you need to be prepared to actually dictate the terms. And you could, the first step is your banker. Go to your banker and tell him you're getting ready to do business with letters of credit. And if he goes, what's that? You need a different bank. You need to be talking to a banker who actually deals with letters of credit, or otherwise they cannot give you advice. Take a class. Learn the parts of the uh, letter of credit. Letters of credit do not have the force of law. They have nothing to do with anybody's legal structure. They all operate off the uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce in Italy or in France. And every 10 years they update the rules. The rule book is very simple. It's like 10 pages. Uh, and it defines what has to be in a letter of credit and what would, would do that. It is a technical issue and the penalties for spelling errors. Remember your uh, grade school teacher who said if you didn't learn to spell, you would never graduate. Well, if you make spelling errors in your letter of credit, you won't get paid. That's what it comes down to. That's a discrepancy. Discrepancies cost you money. If they can't be fixed, you may not be paid. So you need to learn how to do this. This is a technical issue. It's like playing, it's like playing golf before you play golf. You read the rule book, how many clubs can you have and how far can you hit it? Uh, what kind of shoes can you wear? And do you have to wear those uh, plaid pants? Yes, it's a requirement. If you don't wear the plaid pants, you can't play in the masters. So it's a case of knowing the rules. The second method and the one I recommend for newer people and as a learning experience is credit insurance. When you buy a house, the bank puts credit insur insurance on your house. If you buy a car and you owe money on it, you will have, uh, you have to have insurance on it. Almost everything in our lives we have insured. So your accounts receivable is the most second valuable item in your uh, inventory on your balance sheet. So you, why not insure it? You can buy credit insurance very cheaply. We're talking like half a point. And the credit insurance, uh, Easy way is to use XM Bank. XM Bank is not a bank. It's an insurance company. It's a government. We don't like to name things properly, but it's a they sell insurance and they do two things. One, when you bring your customer to the uh, insurance company, they check the customer out. If they come back and say, we won't insure that customer, and that you go, why not? And said, well, he's never paid anybody before. Why should he start with you? You're getting free information, uh, credit information on your customer. You can still say ca sell cash in advance, but you don't give him credit because nobody else will. So if you get insurance, you have the idea that it's not real hard to do because we all do insurance. We've all dealt with brokers. So you insure. The only problem with credit insurance is it doesn't insure stupid. If you, if you are requesting uh, your customer wanted red rubber boots and you sold him blue rubber boots and he won't pay you because it's the wrong color, the insurance company will not pay. Like I said, you cannot insure stupid. You're required to, do, uh, the reason the person didn't pay is because he didn't, he didn't have the money. It's a financial reason. Also, it gives you political insurance. You're selling into, you, you had a shipment into Ukraine when the bomb started falling. That's a political event. The insurance would cover that for you. So XM Insurance it offers you a bunch of flexibility. And the other thing you'd like about it, it's a pay-as-you-go plan. You have the insurance, 
And if you don't ship this month, you pay nothing. Next month, you ship $100,000. You go online, do the calculation, and send them a check. Be sure to send them a check because if you don't pay your premium, you don't have insurance. So these are the principal ways to mitigate. There are other things like cash in advance. Uh, there are other more exotic methods, but these are the two that I would recommend you start with and make it your company policy. I would start with insurance. Graduate the letters of credit. Letters of credit are for places where you can't get insurance, and there are places like that. There, if you were selling to Pakistan, you cannot get credit insurance in Pakistan. You can only use a letter of credit. Their credit the country's credit and the people in the country's credit is bad enough that it's considered too risky for open account sales. But you could still want to sell them something. So figure out the cost of the insurance, figure out the cost of the letter of credit, and add it to your price. Always add this before you quote a price. And a lot of people, uh, people who had bad credit in countries that are risky, they know they're in risky countries. And when they're, they're crying and they're saying something, they don't want to do this because of this, but don't you trust us? The answer is no, I don't. Uh, because this is my business. I'm not betting the farm uh, because I love you. This is a business transaction. So that's the, that's the basis. That, that's a great point to have Mike join in. Um, Dr. Siebert, I know you work a lot to help companies get healthy and make sure they're in a good financial position. Um, could you elaborate kind of what you do and what your colleagues do at the North Carolina Small Business Technology Development Center and what SBDCs do to help small businesses to basically get financially strong? Sure. Thanks, Sarah. So our SBTDC in North Carolina is like our fellow SBDCs across the United States. We're trusted advisors to small business owners and their managers, helping them be more competitive and profitable in just about every way that business touches their lives. So uh, from a financial perspective, uh, if uh, they are an existing business, the first thing we like to look at is how are they managing uh, their funds? How are they managing their receivables and their payables and their inventory if they have inventory? You know, invoicing and following up on invoices, for example, uh, and the timing of all of that, costing and pricing. So we want to look internally to see how well they're managing their internal sources of funds. Uh, and then we also want to look at what are their sources of external funds and what are their decisions in putting together the right mix of those external sources of funds. So uh, the difference might be in those that are starting or early stage startups versus those existing businesses. And even uh, if we look at those more established, let's say mid-sized businesses, um, it definite, definitely um, the options definitely change depending on where a person is in that funding food chain. So just a bit about sources of capital. You know, we all have conversations and questions about money and I need money and where might I get money? So just kind of the basics to review. The first place that I would recommend uh, business owners or prospective business owners look to uh, might be personal assets, right? They must be considered as the first source of capital because most commercial lenders don't offer financing for startups. And, uh, you know, you're not going to be successful uh, in most cases. So, it, friends, family, those types of things. Um, a second source would be debt financing. Most of us are familiar with that. It's a method of raising capital for a business by borrowing money from external sources, uh, and it has to be paid back with interest. Uh, and those financial institutions, we're talking about conventional debt financing now, are uh, there are a lot of different models. But basically, they're going to really want to know that you have the ability to repay the loan. Uh, if you have stability, that means you have experience in the marketplace, you have an experienced management team, entrepreneurial skills, those types of things. Uh, 
It could even involve stability, could even be where you're living and whether or not you own your own home, those types of things or other assets. Credit, what type of credit have you had? The uh, the time that you've had credit, uh, the amounts, uh, the credit limits, if you will, that you've demonstrated a history of uh, borrowing money at for different sizes, for different terms, and repaying that. Uh, and then if all that criteria is met, if if you can demonstrate the ability and the stability and the credit, then typically collateral will control the cash advance. If we need to borrow $50,000 and all our criteria is met, uh, then at some point there'll be a, an examination of what do we have as collateral. And if we only have $25,000 worth of collateral, guess what? That limits our cash advance, even though we may want 50,000. And I'm going to come back to that in a minute because that's where uh, the SBA and XM Bank may come in and help with loan guarantees. The third source of capital is equity financing, and that's a method of raising capital for a business by selling ownership shares of the business to investors. Uh, and some kind of common ways of that occurring is crowdfunding, uh, angel investors, and venture capital. Venture capital, most folks can rule that out unless you're at about $5 million or higher in sales and you have uh, uh, a business model that's really going to um, throw out uh, a high rate of return. So venture capital is a rare type of occurrence for the common business owner manager, small business owner manager. Uh, you'll, you might get some angel investing, but uh, that's usually limited to smaller amounts, let's say up to a half a million dollars. So if you're in need of about a half a million dollars angel investing, uh, member managed angel funds might be a source if we're looking at equity. Um, but if you're uh, if you're in that kind of desert between let's say a million and five million, it's very difficult to find funding uh, in our in our economy. So that gets us to a fourth source, which could be government programs, and and I know Dan's going to talk a little bit about this uh, in a few moments. But uh, for me, uh, one of the best government programs is the SBA loan guarantee programs in general. Uh, they have some terrific loan guarantee programs for international businesses. They have an Export Express program. They have an Export Working Capital Loan program, and they have their Trade Loan Guarantee 7A Guarantee program for longer uh, term loans that are really uh, helpful. Um, XM Bank also has a loan guarantee product, but XM probably is better known for their export credit insurance. And Dan, sum that up pretty well. Uh, and uh, export credit insurance is a way to uh, uh, minimize the risk when you have foreign receivables. In other words, you sell to a foreign buyer and you agree to offer credit or extend credit. So that foreign buyer owes you money and that becomes a receivable. Uh, with uh, XM Bank, there is export credit insurance for a premium you can purchase coverage for that uh, receivable, uh, and it covers both uh, commercial and political risk to some degree. Uh, and then another government program that will be a source of funding or capital, if you will, is the SBA's State Trade Expansion Program, or STEP. Um, it's been a wonderful program. Uh, most, most states have a STEP grant program. We have a robust step grant program here in North Carolina. It's uh, it's uh, managed by our Economic Development Partnership of North Carolina. The SBTDC works hand in glove with EDPNC. Uh, and, and basically for qualified small business owners, uh, they can apply for funds and each state has some wiggle room to establish categories and um, limits for different uses of their grant. But basically, these grants across the nation will uh, subsidize a small business owner or their management team, for example, on things about learning to export, uh, participate in foreign trade missions, design international marketing products and campaigns, um, support website globalization and e-commerce capabilities, 
pay for subscriptions to services provided by the U.S. Department of Commerce. Uh, for example, the Gold Key service, Partner Search, those types of things. Um, and uh, and offset in some cases they'll offset fees that are associated with the premiums of purchasing uh, XM's export credit insurance. So uh, those are just a couple of the things that I would maybe review with uh, small business owner managers that are engaged in international business and also engaged in financing their activities, Sarah. Thank you, that's really helpful. Um, Dan, I'd like to circle back to you and I know you brought up letters of credit in the beginning and you love doing education. Um, maybe you could share some more about how to use a letter of credit successfully and what are some common mistakes you've seen and maybe some 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 tools that people should get educated on in addition. Actually, the first mistake is just saying I'll have a letter of credit with that. You tell the customer that you would like a letter of credit and you put a period after that. In fact, uh, when you say you need a letter of credit, that's the beginning of the conversation. Uh, when you quote a price to a customer, there are really three documents, and you're going to use a letter of credit. There are three documents you need to send him. The first one is a letter, in his language preferably, that you define everything we're going to do in this deal. And it's laid out in a letter, a nice business letter. Uh, it's just a polite letter saying, hey, this is my credit policy. I'm going to require a letter of credit. This is, and you just kind of lay it out. This is going to be the payment. And uh, I'm seeing where people can't hear. Um, no, okay, other people are. Uh, so when you're laying out this, the second document is the actual quotation. Uh, pro forma invoice, where you lay out the item. You, it's the same item invoice you would use when you ship it. You lay it out and uh, you lay everything out and you uh, itemize the prices. You spell out where it's going to be paid for, who's going to pay for it, who pays for insurance, who's paying for the shipping, and where does the, what INCO term controls this transaction. And where and you give the guy a landed cost, which is extremely important. You give the man what's he gonna cost sitting on the dock or at his house or wherever. It's no different than any other order. Whether you when you order McDonald's, you pick it up. Uh, if you go to uh, if you order a pizza, it's delivered to your house. So that's the difference in responsibility. One of them you have to go get. One of them they deliver. So. Shipping overseas is the same way. You have to specify, are you going to deliver? If so, where? Are you going to take it to the bottom of the porch? Or are you going to take it to the door? So uh, there's nothing to do with money. It just tells where this item is going to exchange hands and who becomes responsible for it at that point. Now, <clears throat> and, th and that goes into the last document, which is the instructions for the letter of credit. You're the seller. You get to specify. You get to specify what the letter of credit is going to say. Letters of credit are controlled by the UCP 600. Uh, it's basically a customary type thing established by the Chamber of Commerce in Paris every 10 years. It's a little book that's going to lay out what it's going to look like. And these letters of credit go through a system called SWIFT which is basically the Society of Worldwide Telegraph Operators. It's out of Belgium. It's a private thing that people pay for to join, banks do. And the letter of credit comes in a format. It's got numbers to allow different languages to understand. And each one will has got a specific use. Like for instance, it'll specify the date it's issued. And then it'll come down the date it expires. It'll issue the date uh, of what money are we going to, are we going to use foreign currency or we use dollars? It will specify and it will specify dollar amount. Failure to do this is the biggest single error I see. They all, they told the foreign banker, go ahead and you'll find out that the foreign bankers in India and in China are the most imaginative people you will have ever imagined. Also, they can build things into the uh, letter of credit, which will cause 
you not to get paid. It's not dishonest. You're exp- you're a big boy. You pull up, you know, you pull your pants up and you have to be willing to accept the responsibility for reading and understanding what they ask you. Uh, when you ask for a letter of credit, you tell them what it's going to be there. And you, at the bottom of your instructions, it says, if the letter of credit doesn't look like this, don't bother. Because I'm going to require you to make amendments and that'll cost you money. Because like I said, this is a business decision. And I hate to say, if you're going to do business internationally, you have to be mean as a snake. No mercy. Don't allow anything by you because the people who will grade you on this are bankers. And bankers in a foreign country earn money by finding discrepancies. So if you create a situation where there's a discrepancy, they're going to come back and say, you owe us another $150. Thank you. In fees. And they will take it out of the payment. So you don't even get a choice here. So it is important that you put the letter of credit, simplicity. I had a guy who was doing a letter of credit, and he's an engineer, and they're the worst who read the entire specifications of his machine into the letter of credit. It was like five pages. The rules on letters of credit say that means nothing. You can read all the stuff you want to in it, but the rule is a short description. I'm selling you a red machine that makes red rubber boots. Bottle number six. That's the description. You don't need to describe... uh, how you designed it and everything. It's, and besides, it's not only that, it's irrelevant. And they'll put it in for you, but it means nothing. So keeping it simple, easy to enforce, specifying the documents. If you let the foreign buyer do that, they can include documents that uh, are not asked for, that you can't get. I've had somebody do that. They required a, a guy was shipping cows, pregnant cows, by the way. And he was shipping them to Turkey. And one of the requirements in the letter of credit was a requirement that he get a certificate from the Turkish uh, health people. Well, if you're sitting in the United States and you've got the cow sitting here and you've been ready to put it on the ship, how would you get an inspection certificate from a Turkey, a Turkish uh, medical person? You would have to ship the cow there. So the cow is there. and in other words, you don't have a letter of credit anymore. You just gave up the letter of credit because you allow the buyer to uh, negate the power of the letter of credit. He's no longer, re- he can tell the medical guy, hey, don't pass these cows. And the cows don't pass and you don't get paid unless you want the cows back. And they're pregnant, by the way. And so, yeah, ship the pregnant cows back. They're about to deliver. So, uh you always have to look at letters of credit. You have to specify what's going to be in that letter of credit. And if they try to slip something in that is requires a document, an action that you can't do, that's called a non-letter of credit. You've just given up your letter of credit. Also, the letter of credit has three dates in it. One is the issue date, one's the expiration date, and one's the present date. All three of those are critical dates. If you miss them, uh, oh, hey, give up your letter of credit. This is not an academic exercise. When they say you must ship by a certain date, where did that date come from? Well, you're the one that gave it to them. You're the person that called your freight forward and asked him, when could he ship? He said, I can ship on the 1st of January. Okay, that's the date you put in. However, I recommend you make it the 1st of February. Add 30 days to everything, Uh, plus or minus, almost. Uh, There are words that don't mean anything that, uh, or if they do mean something, they don't mean what you think they mean. Uh, About means 10%, plus or minus. If you're shipping something uh, that comes in a roll, and it says about 100 square yards, well, you you get a 10% variation plus or minus. However, if you're selling a product that is very hard to control, you can create a discrepancy. And remember, when you create a discrepancy, your banker will come up and offer you, say, hey, would you like us to present the documents on acceptance? And you go, oh, that sounds reasonable. What you just said was, I don't like a letter of credit. I paid for it, but I'm not going to use it. 
thank you for giving it up and sending the papers on to the customer. I appreciate you taking care of me. Uh, that's what you've just told the bank. So you you have to understand what you're saying. And, and just because the, it's your bank doesn't mean they're on your side. They're there to move paper. Their responsibility ends when those documents leave. Now, if you have a good bank, they will look at your letter of credit and give you advice. That's why the first thing you do is see your banker. Take your class. If you were doing a big job, you may want to consider hiring a, a consultant. Pay them. Charge your customer for it. But make sure your documents are correct because the full name of a letter of credit is a documentary letter of credit. Your banker is not going to crawl inside that container making sure you shipped everything. He's going to look at the paper. That's it. That's the beginning and end of their interest. The bank on the foreign side is only going to look at it. Remember, the ship may not even be there when you get paid because the documents are correct. So they're going to go ahead and pay you in two weeks. That's what the rule book says. So it's a case of uh, do your documents. The joke is if you do everything right and do the paperwork wrong, you don't get paid. On the other hand, if you ship rocks and do the paperwork right, you do get paid. The, the container there, has nothing to do with getting paid. That's where everybody, I, I shipped the right stuff. What's the problem? Well, oh, you messed up the uh, the documents. Uh, knowing the customs, what's going to happen? So there's a lot of stuff that goes on that you have to take care of, and you need to be precise. This is not a room for sloppy. That's why I said start with insurance. Letters of credit have a place, but uh, when you're first starting, if you're going to do it, get hire an expert. Hire somebody from another company. Go over and stand by the time uh, their time clock and wait for the lady that has been handling their stuff and hire that lady. And hire uh, the person that looks at your letters of credit should be the lady or the guy who breaks into tears over a misspelled word or a comma. Oh, you should have used a semicolon. You used a comma. That's the person you won't do in your letters of credit. The annual retentive of the world have a job. That's the ones. So Dan, I got to jump in and ask. Um, I know that we're in financial literacy class and a lot of businesses are nervous about getting started, although a lot of people get started and are, are doing great. Um, it's wonderful to have you as a resource and other um, counselors like Dr. Siebert to call about these kind of questions. But we all are you know, worried about scams, right? And when you get started, you want to know what some of the red flags are so you can avoid them. I know that you are great at picking up signs of scams because we've done a lot of counseling together and you're excellent at finding them. So do you have any kind of go-to things that you look for, questions that you ask that you think small businesses should, you know, be asking to avoid pitfalls? Yes. The first thing is, where did you meet this person? Have you ever met him? Somebody wants to buy a million dollars worth of stuff from you and they've never shaken your hand. How did they decide to do that? And uh, that's the first thing sign of a scam. Companies do not buy things randomly. Just because it's a foreign company doesn't mean they're stupid. I mean, when they go, they're going to do their, a proper company in a foreign country is going to do due diligence on you. They're going to come visit you. And when they ask you to something you don't sell, gee, I, I need oil equipment. Do you know anybody that sells oil equipment? Sure, I can find somebody. I got Google. So do they. So why didn't they Google the company in te Texas where you were going to? Why would you have to go buy the equipment from Texas? The next thing that's going to happen is they want credit. You don't know them from Adam's house cat, or they asked you to do something. They'll give you a contract to do something. I've had a guy recently who wanted, um, he had a contract in Nigeria to furnish oxygen machinery to a Nigerian hospital, a legitimate hospital with a contract co-signed by the Nigerian government. But it required him to go buy the oxygen equipment in Minnesota and haul it to Nigeria and set it up in the hospital. And then they would pay him for making the oxygen and filling up their bottles and they would pay him. That's what he was gonna do. And I'm going, wait a minute, you have to take your money, go buy the machine, take it to Nigeria and set it up 
and then they're going to start paying you. What happens when they change the locks? He says, well, I got a contract. The contract is in Nigeria, and you're going to go sue somebody in Nigeria or China or South Africa, any place. Uh, just that those places are not the United States. Regardless of what people know about the world, the uh, United States is the least regulated country in the world as far as regulations on companies. Uh, the companies in other countries, they don't, they've got strange regulations, but they have no check and balance. It, stealing is not considered a major crime there. So if, just because you've got a contract, is it enforceable? You can't enforce it here because you're in the United States. It has to be enforced in Largos or Beijing or someplace. And the chances of you winning are slim and none. That's a scam. Any or any place where they ask for money, gee, you know, we're going to do this and uh, we're going to we'll take the shipment. But in our country, you have to hire a local lawyer to uh, handle the money. Here's a list of 10, uh, 10 lawyers in uh, Largos and pick one. They're all the same one, by the way. And you pick one, you call the guy up and you tell him, hey, I'm so and so. And the guy says, well, my, I need two thousand dollars retainer and you wire him two thousand dollars to handle your deal in the Largos. Well, that was the scam. It wasn't the million dollar deal. It was the thousand dollar deal. They just scammed you for a thousand. Don't assume that somebody's gonna scam you for millions. Uh, they'll gladly take a hundred. Or credit cards. Gee, uh, they're not as bad as they were, but at one time I used to get calls and the guy would uh, say, gee, you know, we just shipped something to uh, a place in the Middle East and the credit card was found to be stolen. The guy who they stole it from didn't know it yet. Uh, but when his thing popped up on his deal, he reversed it. When somebody reverses a credit card charge to you, uh, that comes out of back out of your account. And they said, what can we do? And I had to tell them, can you guys spell charge off? Uh, when somebody's want paying with a credit card that you don't know, and yes, you call the credit card company and the credit card was valid. Before you ship, make sure the uh, run the card, get the money in your checking account. Or what well, I prefer, you call the guy up and say, hey, our company policy doesn't allow us to accept international credit cards. If you would go to your bank and get a cash advance and, and wire the money to us, we'll gladly ship next day. That eliminates that. Uh, stolen credit cards are or a pain. Uh, I'll pay you with a check. Uh, how long do you think it takes to clear a check from a foreign country? It's like 60, 90 days. How old will you be when that check shows back up or even from Canada? No, money moves around the world by the SWIFT system. It's wired. They charge you 30, 50 bucks for it. So do that, but avoid anything that's too good to be true. I call, hey, Mike, I hear you know somebody that could sell me some uh, sweet potatoes. I need a million dollars worth of sweet potatoes. If you would go ahead and collect those and get them in a container, I'll send my freight forward to pick them up. Yeah, they might get picked up, but you won't get paid. First time sale is the same as anywhere else. It's a first time sale, first time customer. You don't know them from Adam's house cat. Uh, they're in a risky country and that's easy to check. I keep track of people and and you, uh, you tell them guys cash in advance. Credit insurance. Letter of credit. That's the way you do business. Otherwise, uh, you'll be known as a sucker because in many countries, credit is considered a joke. They're going to give us credit. They break into laughter because they don't plan to ever pay you. So this is a great, great point to step in with Dr. Siebert. So Dr. Siebert, I know you wanted to talk about country risk and commercial risk and economic risk. This is one of the things that SBDCs do, helping small businesses to think those, you know, those risks through and figure out how to build it into a price strategy. Maybe could you um, elaborate on that and what, what you do to help small businesses? Well, uh, thank you, sir. Yes, the you know, what we do just generally across the United States through SBDCs and here in North Carolina with the SBTC is we work to become trusted advisors to the people that we're helping. And those are 
small business owners and their managers. Uh, and um, one of the things that we have seen is, and these are things that we discuss so that, uh, you know, I have this belief that, you know, if people, people generally will make good decisions. So if we can provide more information so that they can make better informed decisions, then we're mitigating risk. So to start that whole risk conversation. So what what I would tell you if you were uh, if you were sticking your toe in the water of exporting uh, is uh, we tend to see uh, four common attributes across all those businesses we work with that are exporting. And they probably won't surprise you, Sarah, but uh, the first one is management commitment. Is that business's management team really committed to international business? Uh, uh, because without that commitment, uh, there are a lot of things that can go wrong and businesses usually can't uh, afford to learn on the job and lose money, as Dan has so uh, eloquently pointed out so far in this webinar. Uh, so management commitment is key. Uh, secondly, experience in the marketplace with your products and services, right? And that can be domestically, but just think about a company that's five years old, 10 years old, 15 years old, maybe even a second generation company. You know, they've had an opportunity to uh, work through any uh, missteps and refine their distribution process, how they maybe they have distribution agreements, maybe they work with agents, whatever their sales strategy is, also with their product, uh, if it's a if it's a manufactured product, you know, working out all the warranty issues. So they have that experience in the marketplace. That's key. It's also key if they're going to do government contracting, by the way. The third is gets back to cash, uh, adequate cash flow. And I said adequate cash flow. That means it goes back to a business really understanding how to manage what we call their working capital accounts, uh, their receivables, their payables, their inventory, et cetera, as well as that external financing that we mentioned earlier. And then just capability and capacity. Do you have the capability to uh, make something, let's say if you're making something in inches and in your facility change that so that you're manufacturing that in metrics, right? Because if we're going to export, let's say to Europe, maybe they're in a metric system and we need to be able to adapt our product. So four, four kind of common things that any business owner or manager listening here today can just ask themselves is, do we have management commitment? Do we have experience in the marketplace? Do we have adequate cash flow? And do we have capability and capacity? Uh, so with that, there are a couple of categories of risk, and I'll go through them fairly quickly. Uh, country risk, commercial risk, and economic risk. So think about this. Really, commercial risk and economic risk are very similar whether we're talking about domestic U.S. market or foreign market. So the big difference is country risk. So country risk, that's the potential for uh, things happening in a foreign country um, that could really disrupt your uh, your sales. For example, uh, a, you know, political or economic instability, uh, currency and convertibility, some of these uh, unusual things, uh, vulnerability to environmental disasters, government nationalization or expropriation, some kind of heavy things. We've got a bit of a bit of that a taste of that with the recent uh, tariff wars that we've gone through over the last three four years um, pressure to comply with corrupt demands for example that you'll see sometimes in uh, in uh, in any course of business particularly in foreign uh, business theft of intellectual intellectual property is another example uh, or uh, prohibitive uh, new tariffs or non-tariff barriers as an example so there are some methods and techniques for a small business owner to mitigate country risks. One of the best is using your U.S. Department of Commerce's country commercial guide. Uh, country commercial guides are a great overview of any foreign market uh, and they're prepared by our U.S. government Department of Commerce. Uh, other 
Sources of information that can help you mitigate country risk include Euromoney, it's a country risk search uh, or researcher, uh, COFAS, which is another uh, country risk assessment, Moody's, Standard & Poor's, some of you have heard of that, uh, Alliance, formerly Euler Hermes, um, but there are, there are a bevy of good resources that one can use to uh, really analyze and understand countries and mitigate risk. So moving along to commercial risk, most of our folks on the call today are probably very familiar with commercial risk. That's the same thing here domestically in the US. If we manufacture a product and we are selling that product um, uh, within our state or outside of our state, uh, we wanna know who we're selling to, particularly if we're going to offer credit, right? So we're gonna make a sale we're going to ship the goods to that buyer and with the agreement that that buyer upon an invoice will repay us. Same thing for international business. Although thinking about what Dan mentioned, it's a lot more challenging to uh, remedy any uh, uh, disagreements when you're doing business internationally. So commercial risk primarily relates to a foreign buyer's financial uh, financials, their ability to pay or to perform. You know, if you think about it, you become the bank. If we talk, uh, think about what we talked about earlier, you know, a lender may look at you in terms of ability, stability, credit, collateral. Well, now you're the lender, right? You're kind of doing the same thing uh, and you're evaluating that foreign buyer. Uh, some ways, again, the uh, U.S. Department of Commerce has an international partner search that can help with that. I mentioned COFAS, Equifax. Uh, uh, Atradius, Alliance, there's some very good sources of uh, resources for analyzing commercial risk. So economic risk, uh, again, most of us are very familiar with economic risk. And so the, the question is, what are the things I have to do internationally that may be different here? But just to review, you know, things like recessions uh, and heaven forbid a depression, those are economic risks. But Sudden changes in currency valuations when we're doing business internationally can create issues that keep payments from being made on time. Uh, some countries have limited currency, so lack of foreign currency reserves can slow down payments as well. Um, inflation in a country can also make it difficult for pays to pay in a timely manner. So these are some common economic risks. And I always put in the category of economic risks, we might as well just for fun throw in foreign exchange, right? Foreign exchange risk. And um, there are several types of foreign exchange risk. I think the one that most of us think of is what we would call foreign exchange, exchange transaction risk. And that's the risk of loss on a particular transaction due to a foreign exchange movement, right? So our dollar in compared to say a, 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 a euro in Europe uh, may be uh, at they may be at one price when we make a quote and we ship something and then those can fluctuate and depending on how they fluctuate um, it could actually uh, you could actually lose money in that transaction uh, and you have a you have a, a risk of gaining money but again you have a foreign buyer and so uh, if someone's losing in that exchange and that loss is a little larger than anticipated, that can create uh, challenges for both the buyer and the seller. So managing foreign exchange is um, uh, something that you can get help with. Uh, there are a lot of qualified uh, individuals that manage foreign exchange, particularly if you're working with a bank that's doing international business. Another is foreign um, exchange economic risk and uh, uh, the best way to describe that is where uh, you have and you have over time our economy here in the U.S., for example, may uh, be healthy enough where our costs are make it prohibitive for us to export. So if we're doing very well in our in our dollar raises, the value of our dollar raises, well, that means that a foreign buyer has to pay a little more for our products if we're pricing them the same as an example, uh, or uh, let's suppose that uh, we have a very robust and healthy economy and our wages are going up. And so those wages are reflected in the cost of our products. So we're kind of becoming less competitive. We saw this 
you know, in the in the 80s, particularly in the 90s, uh, as uh, as many companies were offshoring because of the difference uh, in a number of reasons, but one primarily was the labor. So uh, so that um, you know we've seen kind of a, a reshoring effect where foreign labor markets have kind of gotten more competitive and closer to us. So those are examples of uh, of uh, economic uh, changes. Uh, the other would be uh, now this would be rare and and probably a small percentage of our viewers today, but uh, foreign exchange translational risk, and that really only comes into play if you're a U.S company here that has a foreign subsidiary where you have ownership in that foreign subsidiary. Well, at some point, you're going to have to take the financials from both of those companies, both domestic and foreign, and uh, and consolidate those financials. And so kind of goes back to the first foreign exchange transaction issue. Uh, the value as you translate those foreign, let's say we have a, a foreign distribution center in Spain, for example, and we're um, converting those balance sheets and income statements uh, from that currency to our currency, there could be some, you know, basically paper losses, effectively losses. So the good news is there are professionals and resources that can help manage all of these risks. But um, as a business owner, I think uh, certainly many of these risks you should be working on and managing now, but there are those few additional risks that you need to pay attention to, particularly when you're doing business internationally. So hope that answers your question, Sarah. <laughs> okay. um, oh, got myself on mute. I want to invite Christine and I want also to take a moment to say everybody should sign up for their SBDC <laughs> network, so, um, especially since this is all free, right? Um, but Christine, I'd like to turn it over to you to help bring up some of the questions um, from the audience. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I admittedly we've run a little bit over time because uh, uh, our two speakers, Dan and Mike, have really been sharing the wealth of expertise that they have in helping small businesses, in particular in the North Carolina area. But uh, you both, <laughs> I guess, my question would be for a lot of the the small entrepreneurs and small businesses that have joined us today. What would be sort of the the first thing or you first resource or what's the top thing you would recommend for a small business that's just trying to get to learn more based on um you know getting uh you're just sort of as you said i think mike putting their toes into the international trade space where what, what's sort of the top resource that you guys would recommend for folks uh who after this uh discussion want to learn a little bit more and maybe I can go go to you first, Mike. Well, I uh, I would start with your uh, small business development center in your state. Certainly here in North Carolina, we have a nationally recognized uh, international business development team, uh, uh, E award winners, E star award winners. Uh, actually, we're celebrating the SBA's Exporter of the Year this year uh, for the national award was a North Carolina business called ScienceX. Uh, so we have, uh, and I'm fortunate to be part of a great uh, NC export team that includes. So to answer your question, I would, uh, more precisely, I would uh, I would go to your SBDC. In, in North Carolina, we're all connected and work together. And I realize it doesn't happen in every other state, but we're part of a team. And that team consists of the North Carolina District Export Council. Dan and I are both members, uh, long-standing members of the North Carolina District Export Council. And we provide training on a regular basis called Export University. And Export University is the greatest place for someone that's really sticking their toe in the water around international business, particularly exporting. Uh, and then we also have US Commercial Service. Uh, our US Export Assistance Centers are great partners. Uh, we're fortunate in North Carolina to have uh, a uh, economic development partnership of North Carolina that has international trade specialists and uh, and we have people in brick and mortar in six foreign countries to help our uh, North Carolina businesses uh, get overseas. We also have a strong North for those agribusinesses out there that are small businesses. 
uh, you know, value added foods and such. We have uh, the North Carolina Department of Ag. So look, you know, don't overlook your state's Department of Agriculture. Uh, and uh, uh, and then there are some uh, SBA has some training and XM Bank has some training. So with that, I'll I'll throw it over to Dan in case he's missed anything. Well, I think he pretty much hit it. But if you can't find training for export, uh, being an exporter, you're not looking very hard. For instance, this next slide, this is a, an event that uh, Mike and I have been putting on for eight years. It's a webinar. Uh, the last one we just did, uh, last, last two weeks ago, yeah. was on the uh, how to quote prices. It, an hour on discussing nothing but the but the how to quote a price to a foreign buyer that makes sense. Uh, this next class on May the 3rd will have elements of that in it, but we're going to walk through a, actually walk through a transaction, starting with a letter from a buyer saying, I'd like to buy this from you. And analyzing what the man said, what you got to do, and make the decisions on how you're going to get paid. And then quote, then actually go to the guy with a offer. This is my offer to buy. So it's there's a uh, it's not it's not brain surgery, but it is a procedure, and that's one of the things we like to do. Uh, up in June, uh, we're going to have uh, a banker talk about how to get paid, cash in advance, letters of credit, collections, and open account. What's the difference, and what's the risk? What are your risks, and how do you mitigate those risks? So, uh, and we keep going, and we're going to go into. Uh, Inco terms and logistics. One of the things most small businesses ignore is uh, when the guy asks you for a price, he wants a delivered price. This is like Amazon. When you pull up something on Amazon, you say, how much is that doggy in the window? You don't care how much that dog is sitting in the window. You want it how much it is in your window. That's the price to customers, the landed cost sitting on his dock. How much is that? And you know, think of it, and because uh, I get people, go, I don't want to be involved in shipping and all this. Well, think about Amazon has become the largest company in the world by shipping stuff overnight and promising. And uh, in Charlotte, there's I can order some at eight o'clock in the morning. They'll deliver it by five. So, hey, Dan. Yes. Well, I'm sorry. I was uh, I didn't know how much time he had, but I, you know, you and I both use a lot the the. The International Trade Administration's Trade Finance Guide, which is kind of like the Bible, and we we use that a lot. We share that a lot with our uh, our clients. So I don't know if you want to include that yeah. in there. If y'all need one, if y'all would like some uh, information, written information, just send me an email, and I will send you the trade guide and all the information that we have. Uh, it, the written information, because the amount of information that's available. Uh, will keep you busy for a year. But if you're going to be exporting and you want to enter the game, it's like playing baseball, golf, football. You've got to learn the rules. You've got to know how. And if you don't spend time learning how, you're going to lose. Because everybody this is like going to play baseball and you keep moving up. All of a sudden you get to the majors and everybody is a great player. The pitchers are all throwing 99 mile per hour left handed fastballs and you're going to hit him. So you have to be prepared to move up with. Them. That's why in baseball, they start out with single A and work their way up so they can get used to playing with the expert. These guys in college, they were great. But when you get to the majors, all of a sudden, they're just one of many. Learn the game. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, we, as Sarah mentioned in our hotline, we do uh, work with uh, you, Dan, in particular, but uh, I know you've been using all the resources that you've been talking about today in helping companies really figure this out. Um, I just want to thank you both again for taking the time. It's clear that you've been helping companies through this process and getting paid and what mis what are sort of the the red flags out there and how to mitigate those concerns and so really appreciate you sharing your expertise with us and uh 
at least, and you know, you've pointed out some uh, additional trainings that are taking place over the next several months. And then the the trade finance guide, as you said, is a great place to start. And for anybody who's joined us today and has general questions or is looking to con connect with the resources their local resources. So let's say you're not in North Carolina today, but you want to connect with the SPDC in your net in your area or the export finance manager in your area. You can always feel free to reach out to us at the International Trade Hotline. Uh, easily done through international at SBA.gov. And just one thank you again for taking the time to join us today. And as I've uh, mentioned in the chat, we will be sharing uh, the recording of this session uh, the slides and then also some of the top resources that we've been talking with all registrants in a follow-up email. So thank you again uh, for joining us today and a special thanks to, to Dan and Mike and Sarah for having a really robust conversation. Really appreciate everybody. Thank you.